Well, good morning, Hickory family. It is so good to be with you. As Carly said, my name is Andy, and I'm going to turn the mic off and shout, no. Um, And I am honored to be here giving Pastor Justin a brief break in a series that we have been in uh, really throughout most of the summer on the Sermon on the Mount. And because it is summer, because folks are in and out, traveling, vacationing, I thought before we jump into the verses we're going to look at this morning, we would do a quick review of kind of the main theme of this series. And I thought I'd do that by asking everybody a quick question. I want to see, show of hands, how many people grew up in a family where there was a heavy emphasis, I mean a real priority on the rules, you kind of knew what the do's and what the don'ts were. You, you had no mistake whatsoever. Maybe it was dad, maybe it was mom, you know. Yeah, okay, okay. If you're a student right now, just eyes forward. Don't be looking at mom and dad, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with the rules. Our family has rules. Rules are important. But when there's a huge, huge emphasis, when there's a big focus on the rules, maybe if you grew up in church, you were part of a church that kind of leaned this way. We kind of call them legalistic churches, right? Where you kind of knew what was expected, where to be, where, how to dress, how to sing, you know? If you grew up this way, there is a tendency, there is a susceptibility, Jesus is speaking to this in this entire series, to kind of look at our faith, to look at church, to look at God through a certain filter. And that filter I call the externally moral filter. It is, you know, that, that, that reducing faith, defining faith through an external set of rules, through a list of do's and don'ts, and that we act a certain way and we speak a certain way. And, and you know, God's, Jesus is speaking to this. He's speaking to this external moral perspective that if we're not careful, we, we may have. The longer we've been in church, I think the higher the likelihood is that we kind of lean this way, that, that we look at faith as a list of do's and don'ts. And when we view things this way, lousy things can happen. Um, we, we tend to look at our, our, our faith as we're, we're doing a good job of the do's and we're doing a good job of avoiding the don'ts, at least compared to this guy, right? That's what we do as humans. We tend to compare ourselves. And let's be honest, when we compare ourselves, we tend to look to somebody we think we're better than to build ourselves up by comparison. So Jesus taught about this in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? Two men who are polar opposites when it came to society, both seeking the righteousness of God. The Pharisee steps forward in pride and arrogance and says, thank you, God, that I'm not like this schleb, right? You know, for I am the keeper of the law. I know the Torah backward and forward. I have the warm greetings in the marketplace and the choice seats in the synagogue. I thank you, God, that I'm better than him. And Jesus teaches the tax collector who's like, you know, the lowest of the low, right? He's collecting the tax for Rome. He's collecting extra from his fellow Jews and pocketing the difference. He's kind of the lowest of the low. He can't even look up to the heavens. He beats his chest and lowers his head and says, have mercy on me, Lord. I am a sinner. And Jesus says, the tax collector gets it. He has my heart. He leaves the temple that day righteous in the sight of God. When we view our faith from an externally moral perspective, we tend to compare ourselves, and when we do, we have a likelihood of becoming filled with self-righteousness, that we're better than somebody else at doing the do's and avoiding the don'ts. The other thing that tends to happen is even more insidious. We, we look honestly in ourselves, and we see we're not doing a very good job of the do's, and we're really not doing a very good job of avoiding the don'ts. But instead of opening ourselves up and confessing to, another, to one another so that we may be healed, like it says in the book of James, we instead shove it down and we, we hide it and we push it down and we cloak it and we bubble wrap it in what I like to call the caricature of Christianity. You know what I mean, right? The, the insider language of church going, you know? How are you, brother? Well, I'm... Blessed and highly favored, brother, how are you? Well, praise be to God, right? But inside, you know, you're failing and you're dying, but you've, you've insulated yourself and you've looked from an externally moral perspective to try to garner a certain impression of yourself among others. And you, you cloak yourself around the consideration of Christianity and, instead of allowing the power 
of Christianity to come on in and to change your thoughts and to change your emotions, change your reactions, change your words and your actions in your life. Jesus is speaking in this series and he's saying this isn't faith, right? There's a ton of places we can look in the Bible to see where faith is. I've always liked this verse. It just paints such an awesome picture. I want to share it with you. It's found in Genesis 5:24. It says, Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Can't you just see that picture, right? God and Enoch walking on the road, you know? God saying to Enoch, what do you want to do today? You want to go to your house? You want to go to my house? I mean, my house is like everything. But your house, I have been preparing a place for you. I can't wait to see the look on your face, you know, when I show you what I've prepared for you. Let, let's go. Because Enoch was with God. He's been walking faithfully with God all throughout his natural life. Nothing changes in the eternal. God just continues that relationship that's what faith is. It's not being externally moral. It's being internally connected. Internally connected. It is being with God. It is that God loves us and that Jesus saves us, and that the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us over time and experience. It's about being internally connected. Our need and our dependence is not upon keeping the rules. It's not void of relationship. It's not performing. It's instead being internally connected to God and having his heart on a heart level so that those actions look more, sound more like his son, our savior, Jesus Christ. The bottom line is this bumper sticker for the entire series. You cannot do life for Jesus without doing life with Jesus. If you're doing life for Jesus and it's just performing, and we'll do it well sometimes and not so well other times, we may build up our, our insecurities by looking to our neighbor and saying, well, I'm doing it better than he is, right? Or we may hide in plain sight, knowing that we're failing, but we're giving off this impression that we're doing the right things. You can't do life for Jesus unless you're doing life with Jesus. Having his heart, having his dreams be your dreams and his prayers be your prayers and then built up out of that will be the external evidence of a life in faith. So we're continuing on the third week of chapter six of Matthew and you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know, in the last couple of months, you know that Jesus is teaching on some tough topics, Right? Pastor Justin has walked us through lust, right? And it's 21st century manifestation in the world of pornographies. Talked about forgiveness, which is a sticking point for so many of us who've been hurt. Authenticity, you know, but I am so glad that today we get to take a break from all those tough topics. We're going to talk about money. <laughs> and, and all God's people said, blech, Right? We don't like to talk about money, like Carly said. We don't like to talk about money in relationships, in society. We don't like to talk about money in church. And, and as a result, churches don't tend to approach this topic very frequently. And when they do, it's kind of apprehensive and almost apologetic. One of the many things I love about this church is that we don't shy away from it, because Jesus doesn't shy away from it. But it's worth noting, right, that it's controversial, that it's not one that's talked about often. And, and really, you know, money is a controversial topic in church. Let's just let me put it just out there because the church has a very spotted history when it comes to managing money. There's been no notorious and uh, well known instances where churches and church leaders have done a really lousy job of stewarding the money that God's entrusted to them. So I can understand why churches don't approach this topic very often. But think about it even in Jesus' time. Right? This is one of the only topics that Jesus taught on where the hearers of his teaching left sad and dejected because of the grip that money and possessions can so easily have on us. But just practically, I can tell you firsthand, my wife Suzanne and I, we've for more than 20 years counseled individuals and married couples at our kitchen table. We, same kitchen table. We brought it with us from New York. You know, If that kitchen table could talk, you know what it would say? It would say the things we talk about the most are communication, sex, and money. And it's usually communication about sex and about money. So it's a topic that can so easily divide us and get us off track. It's a, it's a topic that um, 
is, is controversial and difficult to talk about. And yet, as Carly said, Jesus talks about it a lot. In fact, more than any other topic, money, possessions, giving, generosity, than any other topic in the New Testament, about a quarter of his teachings are about this topic. So I'm glad we're talking about it today. Aren't you? Okay, let's jump on in. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in 19. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you grew up in church, you've heard these verses again and again and again. And just like everything else in this series, Jesus is after the deeper meaning, not that surface level, not that if you, if you read that from an externally moral perspective, man, it sets up perfectly like a list of do's and don'ts, right? Do not store up treasure in earth. Do store up treasure in heaven. Jesus is after the deeper meaning. He doesn't want us to read it from an external perspective, a list of rights and wrongs like religion, right? Like just a, an outward external list of doing the do's and avoiding the don'ts. Because as we talked about, we'll, we'll go down some dangerous roads if we do that. If we define or reduce our faith to that surface level, linear, A to B to C to D definition. He doesn't want us to view it with an external perspective. He wants us to view it with an eternal perspective, one that reads these verses very, very differently. If we read it with an eternal perspective, we don't view it as a list of do's and don'ts. We actually view it as encouragement offered from a relationship, from a heavenly father. You know, Justin, a week or so ago, talked about Abba, right? Father, daddy, papa. He's our parent. He's our loving parent who wants a close personal relationship. And in that close personal relationship, he wants to offer us encouragement, wisdom, counsel. He wants us to know, and he wants us to actually, in love, know that we're not God. He is. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He wants to actually save you and save me from a ton of stress, pressure, worry, and anxiety that we can so easily get ourselves into when we have the wrong perspective on our money and our stuff. He wants us to not fall into that temptation to play God as we build our bank accounts, as we acquire and amass possessions, as we diversify our portfolio, as we identify our active and passive income streams. It can so easily get in there that we're the ones building it, that we're the ones controlling it, that we're the ones owning it. God, like a heavenly loving father, wants you to know you're actually in control of a lot less than you think. I want to save you from the worry and the concern that you would otherwise not have if you had the right perspective on possessions. He's really identifying for us a blind spot because unlike some sins that are you know, just as wrong, but more unambiguous, you know, more easy to determine, greed can be a little more difficult for us. We are more apt to see greed operating in somebody else than we are in ourselves. And I think that's why he writes the verses the way he does. You know, we, we typically don't know when we're being greedy, but Jesus wants to make the point. He wants to make it abundantly clear. That's why he uses moths and vermin, right? Mice and rats. Some translations use rust, uh, thieves. What, what commonality are amongst all of these things? They kind of happen in the dark, right? They kind of happen subtly. You know, you don't know that the moths have eaten the sweater until you went up into the attic and pulled it out of the thing. Okay, these moths have been at work, right? You don't really hear the, mo the, the mice and the rats until they get confident that it's dark and quiet, right? Then they go and they do their thing. You know, rust, it just wasn't there one day and then it appears. That's kind of like greed. You know, you, you, you don't know, you don't think that greed has overtaken you. And then all of a sudden, it's there. You know, think about thieves. Any successful thief, their goal is to get in and get out without being noticed, right? If they want to rob again. Anybody ever the victim of a robbery? I was. And we were 12 years old. I was 12 years old, and in my family's home, that year... I uh, have three older siblings, and they were 
in different schools, different bus schedules. My mom and dad worked, so I came home that year for an hour or two to an empty house. So I got the key underneath the mat, opened the door, everything looked normal, like any healthy 12-year-old boy. The kitchen was where I was headed because I was hungry, and turned the corner, and everything changed. It was like a bomb went off. I mean, the, the guy had cased the neighborhood, hit a few of the houses, got in, got out, and ransacked everything. It's, it's, it's subtle. It happens in a moment. It's jarring when these things happen, uh, and that's like greed. You don't think you're, you're, you're somebody who leans towards greed, and yet Jesus wants to, us to know, and that's why he talks about it so much. We're all susceptible to it, particularly if we grew up this kind of externally moral way, doing the do's and avoiding the don'ts and defining our worth, our identity, our faith, how God feels about us based upon how well we're doing the do's and how well we're avoiding the don'ts. What is the encouragement here? Quite simply, it's this. Be consumed by that which will never be consumed. Be consumed by that which will never be consumed. Don't believe the lie, Jesus is telling us. Don't believe the lie that just a little bit more, a little bit more money, a little bit more possessions, a little bit more stuff, a few more toys are going to add anything to our true happiness, our peace, our safety, our protection, the joy in our relationships. There's no amount of money that'll bring any of those things to bear. It's not that stuff doesn't matter. It does. Any, every good gift is a good gift from a good God, and we should take care of it. But Jesus wants us to know not to be so consumed with earthly concerns that we miss out on greater blessings. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says it like this, for we fix our attention not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. What can be seen only lasts for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. We all need the wisdom offered by a loving Papa, a loving creator, because we're all susceptible to allowing the stuff in our lives to make us grow in concern in areas where we previously had no concern. I, I'll give you an example. Anybody remember their first car? Right? You're thinking about it now, right? Yeah. Mine was a, I was in college, and I was, it was a 1985 little four-gear Honda box of steel. It was gold. I mean, it was, it was uh, subtle, right? Um, and I learned how to drive stick on it, and I, I affectionately named her Bessie because Bessie had a lot of character. And um, when people got in it, they kind of figured out what the character was. Bessie had character. Like, it was a really polite way of saying Bessie had no air conditioning. Um, <laughs> Bessie had no rear to frost, right? Uh, in the New York winters, Bessie's doors would freeze shut, right? <laughs> Often had to climb. Suzanne and I were dating at the time. It was so much fun climbing in the hatchback to get into the car. The seal on Bessie's windshield wasn't altogether very good. So, you know, in those winters, it was just, you know, we had a routine once we climbed into the car. Suzanne had her scraper, I had mine. I'd go outside, scrape the outside of Bessie. Suzanne would be in there scraping the inside of Bessie, right? I mean, character, right? It was awesome. It was awesome. Um, when I was in grad school, I lived off campus, a house with seven housemates. And so our cars were all in the parking lot lined up one evening. Uh, some bad men came through and broke into the cars. And they broke into actually all seven of my housemates' cars. I came out thinking I would find Bessie in pieces. I mean, you know, if you opened the door hard, that thing would come off in your hand, right? Um, Bessie was left alone. <laughs> I, I, I think the thieves just went... Yeah. <laughs> Bessie's got too much character to even mess with her. She had her own security system. It was, it was great. Fast forward a few years, Suzanne and I are married in 1997, and we were able to buy our first new car. I mean, you know, black, it was sleek, new car smell, it was awesome, right? Suzanne would get in, and like she always did, she put her bag on her lap. And I'd be, you know, because one of the other things I forgot to mention Bessie had was the, the salt and the ice from the New York winters um, started to erode her undercarriage. You could start on the passenger side to see the road. I mean, it was a Flintstone mobile. Did I mention she had character? Okay. We get this new car. She's got the bag on her lap. I'm like, babe, you can put the bag on the floor. Carpet. It's 
dry. This thing is awesome. We, it wasn't the 21st century yet, but we felt like it was because this car had all these bells and whistles, like air conditioning, rear to frost. It was amazing. But the truth be told, I found myself with this new car starting to act differently. Uh, you guys know, right? If you go to work, you tend to park in the same spot. You come to church, you tend to sit in the same spot. We are creatures of habit. I was that when I went to work, but I got this new car. I parked way away from everybody. I didn't want anybody opening their door, hitting my new black, sleek car. I get out in the morning, take it out from the driveway. Before I do that, I walk around, do a 360, check any little spots, any little dings. I can buff that out, you know, make sure. I started to grow in concern in an area where I had Bessie. I had no concern, even among thieves. She was fine. You know? that, that's what happens. Again, the encouragement is not that stuff is bad or wrong, but stuff has a way of making us grow in concern, in worry, in stress, in anxiety, in ways that previously we had none of those things. So Jesus tells us where to invest in heaven. How do we do that? Well, God tells us how to do that. He tells us to do it with the tithe. The tithe is a biblical term. It a, means a tenth. A tenth of all God has given to you, you return back to him. Um, in, in plenty of places in the Bible, it talks about it. I want to point you to Malachi 3.10. It says this. God is speaking. He says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. We generally are not to put God to the test. And here is the time where God says, put me to the test. See to it that my words are not true, that if you put me first in your finances, that I won't open the floodgates of heaven. If you have an eternal mindset, I will open eternity and bless you and, and bless you in such a way that there is no more need. If we read that verse from an external mindset, we're going to ask questions like this. What are the rules? What are the rules of tithing? I mean, heck, does tithing even carry over? This is Old Testament, Malachi, right? Does it even carry over? Is tithing really a tenth? You know, and if it's a tenth, is it a tenth of what? You're gross, you're not. What are the rules? What are the requirements, right? That kind of A to B to C to D, that surface level, that linear, trying to get your arms around it, potentially to explain it away. And there's folks that, that do that. Does the tithe carry over to the New Testament? My family's been tithing for more than 20 years. When we started to open up the Bible and allow the Bible to have a heartbeat, and a pulse in our lives. I'm just silly enough to take God at his word. I'm just silly enough to say, he, he said, put me to the test, I'm going to put him to the test. I was literally at that point 20 years ago, seeking and searching. I wanted to see what was real. I wanted my faith to meet me where I was at, to help me to be a better man, better husband, better father, better neighbor, better coworker. And as I read more and more of the Bible, I recognized that what Jesus is talking about in these verses, that money is such an important topic that can so easily trip us up. So for my family and I, we started with what is this concept of tithing? But then as we started to do that kind of, what are the rules, what are the requirements, what is the A to B to C to D of tithing, I started to read more of the Bible. And for us, we've settled on on, uh, actually in the same gospel, just a few uh, verses later, just a few chapters later, and other places in the New Testament. Jesus is speaking in Matthew 23, 23. And he says this. Nope, he doesn't say that. Matthew 23, 23. I think we've got some slides mixed up, and I apologize. But... Um, Matthew 23, 23, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and he says this, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice and mercy 
and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. These Pharisees were the keepers of the law and the rulers of the day, and they made sure that they were esteemed, they got the choice seats in the synagogue and the warm greetings in the marketplace. They were looked up to because they had the externals down, right? The whitewashed tombs. Everything on the outside looked good. And Jesus is saying, you're hypocrites because on the inside is dead, rotting bones. You, you focus on the external morals. You focus on the external behavior, but you've missed my heart. You should do these external morals. You should do these behaviors, but they should be built up out of a relationship with me. They should be built up out of having my heart. If you're connected to me like Enoch, right? If you've been faithfully walking with me, well, then these behaviors are just natural outcroppings of that relationship. These behaviors become your heart. You, God loves a cheerful giver. It's not just the rules. You check the box and you write the check and you may do it better than others or you may not do it and you try to fool people into thinking you're doing it. God says, I, wanna, I want your heart. I am unambiguously in this sermon series on the Mount, ruthlessly after your heart. You should tithe, yes. God says, put me to the test in Malachi, right? Jesus says, you should tithe. God says it, Jesus confirms it, I'm doing it. There are so many um, generous people in this church who desire to be connected to God and desire for that connection to grow and that trust to deepen. I want to invite you to Look at the screen for a couple minutes as we look at Polly and Skip Sanders, an awesome couple in our church, as they share with us uh, their own uh, approach to tithing as their own relationship with God has deepened. I was also raised being taught to tithe. I definitely whined and complained about giving my money away. Like I felt like I was losing money. I was very selfish about it. I feel like I just didn't understand the depths of it until I was a little older and was working um, jobs and, and trying to pay rent. I was on my own and I started realizing so much more about how God is my ultimate provider and a way to recognize that is to obviously give back to him. And so doing that more and more started to just kind of change my heart and I it also taught me to trust him with my finances and to have open hands and not closed hands when I does, come to stand this, coming. <clears throat> does this seem like we're bragging? Oh, Andy told us to do it. Um, anyway, so um, that was just more and more established in me and, and then when me and Skid met, it was like God had established it in both of us. And so we were able to decide as a couple to tithe whatever we received, whether it was gifts, tax returns, whatever it was. Then we um, just always ask God to give us the faith to trust him and um, which led to us tithing um, the sale of our uh, previous home. Uh, we just sold it and, and we felt without question we we're going to tithe this as well because it's everything is a provision that we receive from the Lord. So it has been an amazing journey of him teaching us to trust him no matter what's coming next. It's been really amazing. Yeah, we want to share this because it's a joyful opportunity to obey our Heavenly Father with tithing. Ultimately, it's the gospel that compels us mm -hmm. as a church to give because God made him who is rich to become poor for our sake. I, I love them. I, I love their heart. I love uh, the honesty uh, that Polly speaks. You know, she was admitting it. She was like this. You know, a lot of us are like this when we first approach money, the topic, the conversation, the, the, the journey when it comes to money. But as her relationship, as their relationship, as they became a family, grew with God, as their trust with God grew, those hands started to open up. And that understanding of that from an external perspective, what are the rules? Is it gross? Is it net? What do we do? How do we do it? You know, does, if it ends in 47 cents, that's what I give, right? I don't, there's no rounding up. I can, I'm not worried about out giving God, all those kinds of things to then just opening it up to more of an eternal perspective that says, the earth is yours, Lord. 
Everything I have is from you. You're in control. You are my daddy. You are my father. You are my creator. I love that honesty, that, that growth. Um, like I mentioned, for our own family, we've been tithing. Started tithing for 20, 20 years ago. And we recognize, I, I mean, around that time, like I said, faith started to become real for us. I was inspired by the story of, of Rick Warren. Around that time, you may recall, he wrote The Purpose Driven Life. And whatever you think of Rick Warren, or if you read, I think most people on planet Earth read Purpose Driven Life. It was a huge, huge seller. And, um, but I was inspired by the story that when that hit the beginning part of this century and gained in popularity and notoriety and in resources, <laughs> um, that he didn't, he, him and his wife didn't have to all of a sudden go, oh no, we've got a boatload of money now. Now what do we do, right? It was decades earlier when Saddleback was first being formed that God put it on his heart and that they took steps kind of like Polly and Skip just talked about, to trust God with their finances. So they, you know, they started with a tithe. It's, it's, it's a starting point, right? But they didn't stop there. They looked to grow their giving. They looked to grow their generosity, literally grow the percentage that they were tithing year after year after year. So that 20 years later or so when Purpose Driven Life hit, some estimates say the royalty check for one quarter from the Purpose Driven Life was over $9 million. You know, they didn't have to scratch their head and go, now what do we do? They had been doing it all throughout. They had been putting God first in their finances. I think now to a point where they, you know, live on 10 and tithe 90. You know, sometimes when we look at it from a surface level perspective, we say, oh, well, if I had $9 million, I could live on, you know. It's, it's walking in trust. It's taking that step. It's in what is unseen. He says, put me to the test that I won't open the windows of heaven and bless you in a way that there is no more need. You either trust him in that and take that step or you don't. And I just love how I was inspired by that. I, I mean, Mark Rutland was here a few months earlier in the year and he said this, right? He said something like, you know, God's plan's gonna come to fruition. If he wants to use you, you got to hear him. He may, you may not hear him, and he may not use you. He's going to find somebody, right? His plan's not going to be thwarted. That's kind of like that, that Rick Warren, he, he'll, he'll, he tells the story. I, I kind of think that's why God chose me for the purpose-driven life. Not because Rick Warren is great or wonderful, but because he faithfully walked in this area, putting God first in his finances. And God said, it's going to be written through, through you. So what does that mean? That means that while God says, put me to the test, make no mistake about it. God tests what he trusts. God tests what he trusts. Just take my word for it. God tests. Oh, there you go. God tests what he trusts. He's constantly looking to us to see what place does he have in our heart, particularly in these areas like money that can so easily trip us up. Before I became a pastor, a better part of a decade ago, I had a 20-year career in publishing. And at one point, I had 75 people reporting to me. That's a lot of HR aspect to your job. I once estimated, I, I reviewed over 3,000 resumes. I've conducted over 1,000 interviews. Uh, I've hired between four or 500 people. Between those acts, evaluations, promotions, occasional reassignments, um, you learn a thing or two over the course of that time and experience. And one of those things, again, as my faith was becoming real to me and I was inspired by that, I started to adopt this in the workplace. When there was a promotional opportunity, I never had to scratch my head to go, boy, I wonder who's going to be right for this promotion. You know, I wonder who can do the job. You know, I was constantly evaluating, constantly testing to see who's approaching the job from uh, my time and your time, you know? Who's approaching the job with, that's not my job, versus who's approaching the job with, uh, doesn't matter what the job description says, I'm gonna do it, because this is my department, this is my company, I, wanna, I want my company to grow, I want my company to succeed. Anytime I put that promotional opportunity, I was just formalizing what was already happening informally. And that's what God does 
with us. He's testing what he trusts. Just like that story with Rick Warren. I think he was testing and said, yeah, you, you, you have my heart. Yeah, I, I'm going to give you the purpose-driven life because, you know, because I give it to you, it's not going to stay with you. It's going to go. Um, and so Jesus is after our heart. It is a test. But what do our finances really reveal about ourselves? Tim Keller's got a quote that addresses it. He says this, money flows effortlessly to that which is its God. Money flows effortlessly. We are being shaped in our world in so many ways, ways that sometimes we're not even aware of. And our money is going to flow most easily to that which we worship. This is why Jesus talks so much about money in the Bible and teaches so much. The proof is in the statement. I encourage you, take a look at your bank statement. Hold it up. Have a conversation about it. Let it see some light. If you do the bills and your spouse doesn't, talk about it. Put it out on the table. Put your, put your credit card statement on the table. Let it see the light. Let it have elbow room in a conversation. It is undeniable evidence of whether God has your heart in this area of money. Jesus goes on in tw- verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? This has to do with how we see God working all around us. Again, our perspective, external or eternal. Think about it. God is so generous. His generosity is all around us all the time. He gives us beauty in creation. He gives us deliciousness in food. He gives us variety in music. He didn't have to do any of that. He could have given us one color, earth. He could have given us one note in music. I know most of you are shuddering right now, right? <laughs> could have given us one taste in food. What if everything tasted like garlic? And I like garlic, but ugh, God, come on. When our focus is on ourselves, when our focus is on our world, when our focus is linear and just one-dimensional, we we can miss God. I had a day the other day that I just got to share with you. We were up in New York, had some meetings, got to officiate a wedding, visit some family and some friends. And my day started really early. I got to drive my son uh, to meet a buddy of mine who owns his own business about, his name's Melvin, great guy, great family. Uh, We were out to dinner about a month earlier with him and his wife, just talking about our family, talking about our kids. Melvin called me up and said, I'd love to have Sam come with me to my business. I I think he'd have a great time. I think he'd have a ton of fun. You think we could work that out? I said, man, we'll move mountains to make that happen. That's awesome, right? We got up really early in the morning, and my son was excited And I got excited because Melvin's such a great guy. He's got a heart for Sam. He's got a heart for so many people. My son was so excited. I was excited to see my son excited. So I dropped him off. Then about an hour later, I drive my daughter to be at my mom's, to spend the day, do women's stuff, shopping, eating at a restaurant, spending overnight, connecting between the generations. I'm driving back from that to my in-law's house. Suzanne's got a conference call. She often has conference calls, but this one, she's waving me over. I'm like, okay. I look at the screen. There's two women, and they're waving at me. And one is this awesome woman who has started this nonprofit, faith-based nonprofit in New York. We know her from our time in our church in New York. Awesome, awesome woman. She's waving to me. The other woman is actually from here. She works at this nonprofit. God has just changed her life, and she has a key really key role in this organization, and she's waving to me. And all of a sudden, it's like those old movie things. I'm like, I'm just seeing the last several years just kind of go. And I'm like, I'm overwhelmed. And then later that evening, Suzanne and I get to go to officiate a wedding, like I said, a a couple that spent many, many, many hours at our kitchen table. Could have easily gone south, but they fought through, and they persevered. And they kept going after 
Jesus. And as a result, their oldest child, their daughter, got married to a strong Christian man. And, and as a result, this family's family tree is, is looking different. The generations are going to be positively impacted because of God's love, because of Jesus' sacrifice, because of the counsel and the guide of the Holy Spirit. God didn't have to do any of that. And he did it all in one day for little old me. When my head hit the pillow that night, I was blown away, overwhelmed. When we see the love and the generosity of God that way, that poignantly, that unending, all around us, it infects us. It bleeds into us. We start to see our world that way. We start to view things not from an external, linear, A to B to C to D, Tuesday comes after Monday, Wednesday comes after Tuesday. When it stops raining, the sun comes out. We see things from an eternal perspective. God's moving, God's speaking, God's healing. I want you to hear me with this because I really want this, the right tone to be set here. God wants you to enjoy your life. God wants you to enjoy your stuff. Here's the kicker. Everyone look up at me. God does not want you to be owned by your enjoyment. He wants you to enjoy your life. He doesn't want you to become a slave to that. He doesn't want you to become owned by that enjoyment. Just thinking a little bit more. And it could be some really good things. You open that statement up, it could be your kids. You open that statement up, it could be all the fun memories you had with friends. Really good things. God wants you to enjoy your life. He doesn't want you to be owned by it. He's after our hearts. He's after our hearts. Because if you allow yourself to be shaped by worldly perspective on how to be happy, if you allow your perspective to go after earthly treasure, the susceptibility is, and God is speaking to it in these verses and elsewhere in the Bible, you will begin not to believe. You will begin not to trust. And you will begin not to hear the wisdom of God that says, put me first. We're in a relationship. Whether you move to the, look to the right or look to the left, you're going to hear a voice saying, this is the way. Walk in it. God wants you to hear that voice, particularly in this area that can cause so much heartache, can build up so much debt that can seem so overwhelming. Jesus is encouraging us to look at those statements because they are a true and unambiguous window into what we actually value. Final verse I want to look at says this. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, it should say. External perspective on our finances says, I worked hard for this. I worked hard for this. I built it. I accumulated it. I inquired it. I invested it. I diversified it. It's mine. I own it. I control it. Eternal perspective says, everything I have is his. Everything I have is his. I own nothing. I'm a steward over what he has given to me for a few years. What he has bestowed upon me. So what can we do? What can we do? A lot of times, like I said, money can become so overwhelming and the burden and the weight of debt, the burden and the weight of having a wrong perspective, worry, anxiety, stress, paycheck to paycheck, how am I going to make it? Or even if you've got a little bit more, a lot of times, oftentimes we spend up to and beyond that little bit more, so it just compounds the issue and increases the worry and the stress. And because of that weight, we oftentimes feel paralyzed. And as a result, we do nothing. I love this quote I read from Christine Kane. She said this, replace what you don't know about the future with what you do know about God. A lot of times with finances, with anything, 
I, I, when I'm in a counseling session, I, I often say I left my crystal ball at home, right? We don't know the future. And a lot of times with money and possessions, finance, things, toys, stuff, there's a lot of question marks. There's a lot of unknown. Replace what you don't know about the future with what you do know about God. God has said, put me to the test. Not wait until this investment hits. Not wait until I get the promotion. Not wait until I have a few more dollars for which I can then become generous. Replace what you don't know about the future and your future finances with what you do know about God. Put me to the test, God says. That if you won't put me first in your finances, I will open up the windows of heaven, pour down upon you a blessing until there is no more need. The tithe is a starting point, but we've been very consistent in this church. Just like that concept, I've got to have more money for which to become generous. Well, I can't do 10%. I can't afford that. Begin. Begin, right? If it's 3%, begin. Because the Bible says God delights in small beginnings. He rejoices to see the work begin. The issue is not the amount. The issue is your heart. That if if 3% is going to stretch you, take a step. Take a step. Begin. Declare to God. Declare to yourself. Open those hands. Say, I trust you, Lord. I'm going to take you at your word. God, you invited me in a way that Put me to the test. Don't hear that too much. I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to walk like Enoch with you in this area. We showed you Skip and Polly. There are countless stories in this church, even the last couple of months. God will change the song. God will remove the barrier. I'm dating myself now, but God will stop the world melt with you. He will. He's that big. He's that big. Those are, those are easy matters to him. Those are easy matters to him. When we see the generosity of God, how easy it is for him to remove those barriers, to renew those thoughts, to answer those needs, then we too begin to delight, even in the small beginnings. But begin. Put God to the test. And take him at his word that he won't bless you until there is no more need. I'm going to ask you all to stand. I encourage all of you, if you've got serious money issues, we can help. I want to encourage you to talk to me. I want to encourage you to talk to Pastor Justin. There are places... And there are people that we can direct you to, to offer encouragement, guidance, sound wisdom on how to get back on track. But I want to encourage you, that's practical, I want to encourage you with this eternal mindset. To talk, have conversations. Trusted people, talk to your spouse, talk to your family. How can we get better connected with God in this area? How do I grow? How do I open my hands? How do I round up? That's a concept that has helped me immeasurably. You know, we're talking here about the tithe. If your tithe ends in $43, just round up. Continually, regularly. You, you, you go somewhere and you pay with money. I know we don't, we don't do this a lot anymore. Pay with cash, you get chained. Round up. Even if you put the tip in, just Dump it in the tip truck. Round up. Just continually say to yourself, this doesn't have a hold on me. I'm going to put you first, Lord. You're my, you're, you're my heavenly creator. Everything belongs to you. I don't want to fall prey to stress and worry, anxiety with regards to money. I want to put you first. This quantitative math aspect, a, t- a tactic of rounding up, 
bleed into your qualitative aspects of your life, your relationships. You find yourself rounding up to others, rounding up particularly to others who don't deserve it, instead of meeting them with in kind, giving them what they've given you, you end up rounding up. Put God to the test. Take him at his word. I want to pray a quick blessing over you. Father God, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you would just meet each person here where they're at. I pray that you would reveal to them in the way that you've wired them exactly what this looks like. Because we can so easily get overwhelmed by this topic that we end up getting paralyzed and we do nothing. Lord, give them the wisdom, give them the strength to obey what you say in your word, to start, to have the courage to look at their statement, to have the courage to identify what it's going to take for each and every one of them to take a step of trust and of faith, putting you first in their finances, putting you to the test. Not because you've got a purpose-driven life book for each and every one of us. But here's the motivation, Lord. And here's my prayer for everybody in person and online. We don't want to miss one iota of a blessing that you have for us, Lord. Every blessing that you open up the windows of heaven and have earmarked for us, we don't want to miss so we want to put you first. We give you praise, glory, and honor in advance. In the name that's above every other name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us worship him now.